welcome to Work Life by Design. I'm your host, Mel Marsden. As a passionate entrepreneur with a desire to create places where people and business thrive, I hope to inspire you to find your place at work and in life so you can live a life by design. You'll hear stories of transformation, exploring everything from organizational psychology to brand and identifying opportunities in your workplace and your life to inspire your human potential. So let's get started. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Work Life by Design. Creating a work life that you love doesn't mean that you need to head out and set up your own business. Often we hear of people who have climbed the corporate ladder only to hit burnout and decide that the only way forward is to take their skills and go it alone. Well, today's guest is here to share with us how if being an entrepreneur is not the path that you desire, there is another way. Olivia Rulo is the CEO of Business Chicks, stepping into the role in 2016 when founder Emma Isaacs expanded into the US. Business Chicks is Australia's largest and most influential community for women in business committed to the personal and professional growth of women. Liv has had a portfolio career starting out in industrial relations before joining Business Chicks to lead their partnerships and brand team for four years from 2009. She spread her wings in 2013, moving across to the Commonwealth Bank, where she drove a unique leadership and culture agenda for the corporate banking division, focusing on embedding vision and values to create a more human-centric culture. Liv has a deep passion and sense of purpose, advocating for women's economic security and empowerment, advancement in leadership roles, and supporting the growth of female-led businesses. As you'll hear in today's chat, Liv comes from a lineage of strong women who have done much to support the advancement of women, and it is an absolute pleasure to have someone who I deeply admire for the culture that she has built within the team at Business Chicks join me to share her wisdom. You're going to leave this conversation inspired and with a whole new perspective on how you can design a life that you love. So let me introduce you to Liv. So welcome, Liv, and thank you so much for joining me today. It's absolutely lovely to have you here. Thanks, Mel. So thrilled to be here. So good to chat. It's been too long. I know. It has been a while. Now, Liv, you started out your career in industrial relations. You've always worked in the space of developing people and working with people's human potential. How has your career really evolved to bring you to this point as the CEO of Business Chicks? Yes, well, it's been um, a long kind of journey, Mel. I turned 40 recently, so I've officially been working, I think, for about 22 years, contrary to what I think in my mind, kind of mentally where I'm at. So I was born and bred in Western Australia. I started working from a young age due to, you know, family necessity. I combined work and study. I always was interested in industrial relations and I actually worked with unions in WA in the early part of my career. Um, I spent a lot of time on work sites, particularly with building trades, checking on the welfare of trainees and apprentices. So I was really interested in the dynamic of kind of workers rights, so to speak, and ensuring equality, gender agnostic sort of worked across, I worked mostly with blokes at that point and quickly learned that I really love working with women. But um, (laughs) yeah, so so I started in industrial relations in WA. I then shifted to Sydney 20 years ago. I moved to wonderful Sydney because I wanted to study social economics at Sydney Uni. I met the wonderful, wonderful Emma Isaacs at her temp agency that she ran at the time called Staff It, which was this gorgeous little temp agency. I went in and said, oh, do you think you can give me a couple of days of temp work a week, you know, doing admin or something? And she was like, come and work here. You need to come and work here with me. You know, when's your birthday? I was like, oh, the 4th of July. Oh, my God, I'm the 3rd of July. You know, this was meant to be. And I was like, this is really <laughs> weird. Um, I was very fresh off um, the plane from Western Australia and Sydney was very kind of shiny and exciting. And I was like, wow, these people are a bit weird and crazy, but this is cool. I started working in her business, which was extremely people-oriented, right? 
right? So um, we were a HR recruitment consultancy. We did really, really, really fun jobs. You know, we worked with really cool clients. Um, We were really deliberate with the sort of clients that we worked with and everything was around servicing and supporting a lot of women to really design exactly the life that they wanted through the jobs that they chose. So really supporting and advising as well around, hey, this actually isn't the right opportunity for you versus I think this is a really, really cool opportunity and you absolutely are good enough and you're absolutely the right person for this role. That theme did start to build through my career. I then went on and ran the New South Wales operations for a larger recruitment company, um, which was really, really cool at the time. Then I was came back to M like a boomerang and set up the kind of <laughs> partnerships team at Business Chicks, which was really fun. And then I went into banking and there was a method to my madness with that, definitely. Basically, the challenge in the space that I worked in was around um, working within a strategy function, but how do you create double-digit growth? from like a business banking perspective. And our view very much was around, well, you need to see a step change in culture because the technical skills are things that people can learn. So we wanted to create better humans, so to speak. So how do you get people to be more in touch with their humanity and feel more connected to their customer? And we did the most incredible work in that space that I feel so, so proud of, Mel, um, in terms of taking groups of bankers to India and sitting and learning at the feet of wonderful, wonderful village women around things like succession planning and vision and um, pulling people up, you know, as you bring people down, as you're reaching up rather, um, and I know that the impact of that work has changed a lot of the, the lives of those wonderful bankers that I got to work with. So that human potential piece has absolutely been a, a thread in my career. And then back to Business Chicks five and a half years ago as CEO when M moved to LA. So that's kind of a quick snapshot um, of, of what I've done. There's a real humanitarian thread that that weaves its way through there. And I, I love what you were talking about in terms of the work that you were doing at ComBank around creating that vision and values piece to really change the culture. Because like you said, those technical skills can be learnt, but what was the impact to some of that embedding of the vision and values work that you did there? Yeah. One thing I think is super important, whatever industry you work in, whatever role you work in, is supporting your people to feel connected to the work that they're doing and taking ownership and accountability for that. So, you know, a customer picking up the phone to their banker and saying, oh, you know, I need to get X, Y, Z loan. And the banker saying, oh, the bank, the bank, and referring to the banker saying, you are the bank. You're the bank. As far as the customer is concerned, you're the bank. And I say that to my girls at Business Chicks, like your Mm. business chicks, whoever's speaking to you. So, you know, creating more of that connection, I suppose, to the work that you're actually doing is really, really critical in terms of embedding vision and values. So really starting with what are your values as an individual And can you weave some threads from your values into the company values Mm. so that you feel a much stronger sense of meaning in your work? If you really can't do that, then you're probably not working in the right place. You know, like you doesn't mean you need to be, oh, my God, I'm the most passionate person about banking in the world. But you'll find that when you actually help and support people to really understand their values, they get this kind of aha moment of, oh, okay, I'm actually super duper passionate about customers. And so I'm going to design my week so that I'm actually spending a little bit more time with customers, you know, which makes sense, you know, Mm -hmm. or, hey, I'm really, really passionate about, you know, my team probably more than the customer. Maybe I'm better suited to an internal kind of ops role supporting the team as like a business improvement manager or something rather than doing customer facing work. So, and then you just find as that stuff starts to land with people, it is a lot easier to really embed changes around people and culture, but really at the end of the day, Mel, without sounding too gushy and kind of kumbaya s, when you see and witness incredible raw leadership, like we do in places like India against all odds, you really untap and think at a deeper level about what is possible for you. 
Mm. and what your potential might be if that is possible, if that makes sense. And there's no yeah. way that you can leave from that experience not changed, even just a little bit. I don't know, it might be for some people we saw changes as simple as they became way better storytellers with their team. Mm. And so we know that connecting, particularly in environments like banks, I don't know, I put poor bank, I keep using the bank as an example. <laughs> if you can connect through storytelling and that sense of vulnerability, you're going to build better, more trusting relationships with your colleagues and peers because they're going to see you as a human. Mm. And the benefits that are reaped as a result of that um, have to impact culture, which then goes on and impacts performance, business outcomes, profits, Mm. shareholders etc so we really really focused on in that work in a meaningful way yeah it's got a real ripple effect and I think too having that individual connection to what the purpose is of the organization and having alignment between those values it does make a really really big difference and I know personally I went to Malawi with Business Chicks and the Hunger Project in 2016 and it is just a magnificent experience and you, you, you're you right, you can't come away from that unchanged because when you see what they can do with so very little and all of the privilege that we have and the access to resources and, and where we live, you kind of sit there and go, well, if, if they can do it, then there's absolutely no excuses why it's not possible for me to be able to come back and do that as well. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, huge, huge impact there. Now question I have for you is this season is all about designing a work life that you love. And I think that a lot of the time people do associate that with then running your own business and leaving the corporate world and, you know, setting up your own, your own shop and and running all of your own businesses. Now you're a testament to the fact that that's not necessarily the way that you need to go to be able to design a work life that you love. Can you tell us a little bit how you've designed your work life and your career to progress yourself into this role here as CEO? Mm, sure. To be totally honest with you, Mel, like in the early days, I don't think I did. It's only been as I've sort of grown a little bit older, which is common. And I see this all too often with women that I've really built that intentional kind of confidence around going after things that I, I really, really want in, a, in an intentional way. But um, I do know that I have deliberately gravitated towards leaders that are very, very human centered. So I um, am not so someone that has to be working in X, Y industry. Some people are. They're very like, I only do this industry. I can find meaning um, and purpose in most industries. Like I, I'm not fussed as long as the, the, the organisation I'm working for is aligned to a degree with my values. Like I, mm. I wouldn't work for like a tobacco company, for instance. But I think the banks, for instance, do some really wonderful work. I think they're incredible. I think that there's incredible, incredible people that work in finance. And I've always just really focused on who it is that I'm working for, who I'm working with, and I've been really, really intentional about the impact that that has on creating the life that I want because that's important to me. That's one of my values. So what I mean by that is I would never be able to work for a you know command and control style leader so when I I've never actually interviewed for a job so I'm not going to say when I've interviewed for a job <laughs> I don't want to lie that's absolutely not true. but when I've considered opportunities that have arisen yeah. the number one factor for me beyond the work because I have quite a portfolio kind of career in terms of mm. what I've done has been who am I working with so um, like I said, you need to think about what are your non-negotiable buckets when you're designing that, you know, work life that you want. So like I- I'm not an entrepreneur. I don't have aspirations to own my own business. I know that about myself. I am a little bit of an entrepreneur, I suppose. I, I like to let, you know, create really cool opportunities, but I like working for, for other people. I feel really happy with that and the decisions I've made around that. So then I go, great. So I know my buckets are always going to be working within a team essentially. I'm not hugely resilient if I'm solo. You know, some mm. people are like, I really need to be around good people. Um, that connection piece is super important for my grit and resilience. So I know that about myself. So a second non-negotiable bucket is awesome team. Third is 
meaningful work, you know, and I sort of have my own to create three or four little buckets of your non-negotiables and use that as the guiding kind of document, so to speak, when you're making decisions around your career, because then you'll find that you can design the work, like if work-life balance is super important, gravitate towards leaders that role model work-life balance. Mm, And I think you're right there in terms of role modeling. You need to be able to see it to be able to know that that's going to be a good fit for you because you can, you can visualize it. Yeah. So ask the questions, like do the, do the interview back. Like how do you manage, what does a typical week for you look like? If he says, well, you know, I get up at 4.30 to cycle 50K, so I'm in the at my desk by 7, and then I typically work through it about 6. I'm, I try to sort of eat with the family from 6 to 6.30, then I'm back online. And if you're someone that balance is really important, there would be red flags for me with that, right? Mm, yeah, the similar expectations will flow down, absolutely. <laughs> Great. Well, John, you know, just FYI, this is really important to me. Spending time with my children after work from 3.30 to 5.30 is sacred time for me and my family. Um, and if he sort of says, oh, yeah, okay, um, wrong fit. Yeah, it's not going to work. <laughs> not going to work. And look, you've got a really strong sense of purpose from what I can see about supporting and empowering women. Personally, through your own actions, but also through the work that you've done with Business Chicks and what you do continually with Business Chicks, is that strong sense of purpose always been there for you or is that something that's evolved over time? And Tell me about how that's come to be for you. Sure. I've always had a very, very strong um, sense of purpose around supporting and advocating for women. I grew up with a single mother, goes right back to childhood, which often purpose and passion do. Yeah. And just, I just want to, the caveat to all of this is I have a very, very strong view that purpose can evolve and change over time. I don't think purpose is this like finite thing that's like, that is my purpose and my whole life is around that purpose. I think purpose evolves and changes as we as women evolve and change and our life circumstances change. But for me, the thread that has been woven through my um, life and career decisions very much stems back to losing my dad very, very suddenly when we were 11, 9, 7 and 19 months, having a very strong uh, mother that worked, you know, three jobs to support us. Us, sent us to the best possible schools that she could by doing night duty, um, you know, as a nurse, seeing the grit and tenacity of my mum. And she won't mind me sort of mentioning this, but, you know, she sacrificed years, right, to raise us. And essentially when she came, t- came time for her to retire, she had nothing because everything mm. had been given to us, right? So yeah, women's economic empowerment has been something that's been woven through my career as well because I've seen what happens to women. They don't have super. They're not as supported in terms of starting and scaling their own businesses. They go through marriage breakups and they're always worse off than the male, it feels like. They, you know, so so that piece has been woven through as well for me. I want to see female businesses succeed. I want to see women reach up to leadership roles, earn good money, get good superannuation and investment advice. Um, So that's super important to me. And that stemmed from seeing the situation with my mom where she just struggled, like everything, you know, like it was just a struggle because she was such a good mom and she just gave everything to the four of us that, you know, if it wasn't for my siblings and myself, she could have been a statistic of a woman over 60 Mm. that ended up homeless. So anyway, so that's kind of where that all came from. So the purpose piece around equality for, for women and men, but also advocacy and where I can using a platform for the betterment of, of women. So at the bank that meant starting a women's circle, which became a huge thing at CBA um, because I wanted to create a safe space for women to really support each other and back each other. Um, So whatever the role I had, I tried to create opportunities for women to feel they had a place where they could be themselves, be safe, be encouraged, you know, get the skills and um, support that they need to strive a little bit higher. And that has kind of, yeah, like I said, stemmed from childhood. My my grandmother also in the 1940s and 50s in Western Australia founded Probus, which was the first working women's community 
Um, she was the first president of Probus in WA. She um, was a cadet journalist in Western Australia and then went on to become a business owner. She owned a florist because that suited her life better with children than being yep. a journo. And so I've always kind of had strong women, you know, guiding me. Absolutely. You've had some fantastic role models in your life and you can see that thread goes back through generations. And, you know, the strength and resilience that your mum has shown through that time and then I can see why you're so passionate about that now and how that is showing up in the work that you're doing. And, you know, in, in some ways we are all very fortunate for the experience that you have had because of the action that you are now able to take to to spread that wider in our community. And I can see that you've had some really strong values that have been instilled in you and you've been using those to navigate your career right up until this point. Yeah, trying, you know, we're all a work in progress, hey? (laughs) Yes, we certainly are. Thanks for tuning in today. This season is all about designing a work life you love, but you can't achieve this if you don't know what it is that you want from your life and from your work. So to help you with this, I've created a free downloadable to get you on track. This little downloadable is my toolkit to clarifying your purpose and uncovering your values. Two things that I like to think of as setting my North Star, the place that I am heading to. You can grab this at melissamarsden.com.au forward slash North Star. Now, let's get back to the episode. Have you had really clear goals around what you wanted from your career or have you sort of just taken opportunities as they've arose and decided whether or not they're going to be the right opportunity for you? Mm, I would love to say, yep, I've had these like five-year, 10-year plans. (laughs) I definitely haven't. Um, And I think given the climate that we're all in now, I think the Mm -hmm. work is evolving. You know, like what's a five-year plan, right? At the moment, it's just it's an abstract kind of science sci-fi thought but I did do an exercise Mel about 20 years ago probably now where I wrote down the vision for my life and that was such a super easy exercise like where you just put yourself you imagine like walking into your home at 40 or whatever it may and what who's there like who's around you because I'm so people oriented what are you doing you know I set intentions more than Mm. goals I'm not really like a goal setter like I'm just not that person but I have always known that I've kind of wanted to make a small amount of difference if at all possible again I'm still a work in progress with with that and I'm certainly taking you know more intentional as I've got more more older and as I move and navigate my 40s now I'm way more intentional because I'm way more time poor as well so not so much goals but just around like what sort of people do I want to be working with and what sort of work do I want to be doing and then you do the backwards plan around well how do you create that and make that possible. Did you find that having that um, that vision and that intention for your life has then helped you to guide and make decisions along the way because you had some sort of concept of where you were heading? Yeah, definitely. And it's definitely um, matured and, you know, advanced. Yeah. yeah, And a lot of the things that came up for me were around family. You know, I always wanted a beautiful family. I saw my mum's struggle. I wanted to find a really supportive partner. And that was really, really important to me. And I do think that helped me avoid some crappy decisions potentially, But I think because I had quite a lot of tragedy and adversity in my life for my teen years as well, the vision for my life was actually one of safety and stability, which I know that's not very cool because there's a lot of like take challenges and take risks. But to me, I didn't really ever want that. I wanted a life that was around love and like the divine ordinary is actually what Mm -hmm. I craved because I didn't have that growing up. Like everything was a little bit more complicated than that and I had there was a lot of death around our our family and a lot of tragedy and so I just wanted the divine ordinary and that was really the vision that I sent set for my life I wanted to be on a beach you know eating watermelon with my kids in summer I wanted to be able to afford to be able to have a holiday every year you know so I know that's probably awfully vanilla But along the way, I've really grabbed life experience and awesome, awesome experiences. But I've also been really, really settled with 
the divine ordinary. I do it. I, I, I love curling up with a glass of red wine and a great book and spending time with my kids and not spending time with my kids and having a really strong group of girlfriends and having an insanely amazing group of work colleagues who I call friends and having this beautiful community of members and and corporate partners who become friends you know that to me is living yeah it's a beautiful thing to have that life free of drama and free of complexity and to feel like it just flows and it comes with ease I think that's uh, that's a really quite a perfect little dream to me as well (laughs) that's a vision (laughs) as we all know it's it's never quite devoid of 100% of um, challenge and drama but I don't know like I'm not always longing or looking for something else yeah yeah it's the ideal we all aspire for (laughs) yeah not quite there yet though (laughs) <laughs> and you've just returned from mat leave speaking of family so you've just had your second child henry now as the ceo of such a large organization as business chicks how did you manage to take mat leave i'm super impressed by the fact that you've done that because i know that i didn't even get the opportunity to do that with my daughter so i think i'd love to know but i think something to do with your team may have had something to do with that but also what has the influence of becoming a mother yourself had on how you lead that team. Yeah, for sure. The path to motherhood has not been easy for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, I didn't take very long with Gracie, my four-year-old, at all. Um, And as a result, I think that I kind of spiralled a bit, just to speak completely candidly. I felt quite depressed, probably was postnatal depression. I don't know. I just was not myself for about six months because I was constantly trying to be everything to everyone Mm. and very quickly. And I just was not successful at that at all. So I wanted to do things a little bit different with Henry because again, he, I didn't think we would ever be able to have him. We, you know, went through the IVF process again in last year during COVID and um, little Henry came along in January of this year and he's my little baby, you know, and I wanted to spend time with him um, and just soak it all up because I just enjoyed it so much more than I did yeah. with Gracie. I hope she never watches this. <laughs> I'm looking around somewhere in the house now. But um, no, they're, they're beautiful, beautiful kids. She's a handful, but God love her. I just loved it with Henry. I just didn't feel the same ugh, pull of being everything to, to everyone with him and I felt really comfortable to be more vulnerable about that so it was yeah. like hey I'm not I feel no shame as this career woman to say I want to spend time with my baby so I did and like you said I empowered my leadership team to just be their freaking amazing selves and they don't need me you know so um they kept in touch I certainly didn't dip out for six months but I put the support around me that I needed um with my wonderful EA Danny with Amber our incredible GM (laughs) with them but you know they kept me in the loop with um you know big decisions but really it was a great time for the team to just get in there and lead you know So it kind of worked. Um, But, you know, again, like I said, you know, I'm the first to say these things work one week and then there's a crappy week and then it's like it's like anything, right? And I wasn't completely dipped out. Like there was still a lot of phone calls. Yeah, still plugged in. (laughs) Yeah, of course. But it was done kind of on my terms and I really set boundaries this time Mm. and I don't think the team were any worse off for that. And it's important for me to role model that with the wonderful group of women that we have working for us at Business Chicks because a lot of them are pregnant. There's a lot of baby (laughs) making going on at Business Chicks. (laughs) I keep seeing the post come up. I know. You'll see more soon. There's a bunch of triggers. But like you said, the experience from one child to the next is very different. We we react differently personally. We have different circumstances and we just kind of have to roll and adapt with that, I think, too, because I know for myself, the, the experience I had with my oldest daughter compared to the experience I had with my recent baby are very, very different. And having that support of that team around you is a big part of, of making that work, I think, as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. Well, did you find that with this one you felt more supported or less less just because of the situation that I was in at the time but I had time off with my first and I didn't take the full amount of time because I needed to I needed the mental stimulation to get back to work and then this time I was back two weeks after she was born but then trying to 
I was being pulled in a hundred different directions. So very much like you were with Gracie, I think, but it was just situational need. Fortunate though, because I really felt like I did get the best of both worlds, even though I was being pushed and pulled because I was spending time with her and I was sort of running my business baby at the same time. So hindsight's lovely. I know. We're all just doing our best. So I think everyone yeah. needs to hear that, you know. Yeah, we're all just figuring it out as we go. A lot of days do not work as I intend for them to work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they don't. But I suppose that sort of as leads to my next question is, as a leader, how have you really consciously shaped that culture at Business Chicks? Because I have been a Business Chicks member for a number of years and I've seen the beautiful culture that, you know, you and I met back in 2012, just before you went off to Combank and the culture that Emma had created and you were a part of that and then coming back. What do you think that magic is and that secret sauce that you guys have been sprinkling around in there? Oh, good question. I mean, f- for me personally, because, you know, it, it was really tricky coming on as the kind of inaugural CEO to a founder's business, Mel, and M won't mind me sort of sharing that. Like I spent, I think, the first year trying to fill her shoes before I mm. kind of worked out that I just, I'm, I can't do that. Like M is M and Liv is Liv and we're completely different people contrary to um, the fact that people think we're like maybe sisters or something, we're definitely not. And we're actually quite different and we have really different strengths and we have really different working styles. And I was never going to be able to replicate what she did or does. And that's okay. And I set the intention for myself when I came on as, as CEO that the most important thing for me was leaving a legacy, you know, as a, as a leader of someone who cares a lot about her team and to be someone that encourages them to make mistakes and to fail and to take risks and that I wanted them on board with creating Business Chicks as this place that was like the best place ever to work, not with gimmicks of having the best book, playbook and this and that, like just genuine, excuse my swearing, but like giving a shit about each other. Like that Mm. can't be, that can't be forced, that can't be made up. That was quite important to me, you know, as the CEO. The most important factor to that was very much intentionally creating a very, very safe environment for the team to um, be themselves, to be human, to not expect everyone to be giving 4 billion percent at the expense of something else, to be vulnerable and show up as who you are and not be apologetic about that, to say, hey, my head's not in a great space today, I'm going to take the day off and not feel fear for your job, you know, in doing that. That stuff has been really, really intentional. Um, Psychological safety, for want Mm. of a better term, to me is the the most important ingredient in creating cultures where humans thrive, which are workplaces, right? So Mm. um, I very intentionally created a culture through vulnerability and showing up, you know, um, with I don't have all the answers, we're working this out together, to I'm having a really bad day um, with the kids. Last year I took a couple of mental health days and really was honest about that. So said, hey, team, I'm taking a mental health day. We have wellbeing days at Business Chicks where I've mandated that people take a day off every few months to do something that lights them up, whether that be lying on a beach and read a book or watch Netflix all day or play video games, whatever it is that lights you up. And you have to take photos as evidence that you didn't (laughs) work or do anything else. But I don't think you can be a leader in this day and age if you do not care about your people. Mm. Like You have to care about your people. Like, And if you don't, you probably shouldn't be a leader. Yeah. Makes a massive difference is that investment in those people because without them, you've got nothing. Totally. And the deeper the relationships I have with my people, the easier it is to have tough conversations with them Mm. because there's mutual love, respect, admiration. So I can say, what's going on with you? Tell me what's going on for you. And I feel really confident and comfortable to have those more challenging conversations with my people because we put the effort in to show them that we care about them and we yeah. actually do care about them, right? So they know that the, if I'm asking those sort of questions, it's not coming from a position of like, 
oh, you're not doing a good job. It's coming from a position of I care about you and I care about your well-being. So what's going on for you? Why are you not kicking your goals or like achieving the outcomes? And nine times out of 10, there's something going on for them. I don't know, like that that has been pretty in- intentional for me. Um, and again, Em and I both show up this way in terms of um, we're flawed humans. We don't have all the answers. You know, we say when we don't have the answers, we take accountability when we've stuffed something up shirking responsibility is about the worst thing you can do as a leader. Um, I try to make quick decisions and then say, but I might change my mind, but I'll make a quick decision, (laughs) you know, and then they know. Um, I've tried to give as much clarity during these times of pandemic times Mm -hmm. as I can, but then also said, you know, there's lots of things that I can't give you certainty around and just being honest with them about that. But really that to me is how you shape culture. Yeah, there's a level of trust and respect that comes and it's a mutual trust and respect and the depth of relationship that comes from that. Totally. And as I always say to my team, and they'll laugh if they watch this, my biggest kind of, oh, yes, we've kind of nailed it, is when the girls spread their wings and fly away. Yeah. You know, that to me is like the most beautiful thing for a leader is for someone to say, I've grown as much as I can grow here and now it's time for me to push myself to do something else. That's the goal or the hopes that I have for, for my whole team. That's just like, yes, we've succeeded as an organisation. My job is not to keep you imprisoned for 15 years <laughs> doing the, you know, the same job because you're too scared to leave. It's to push you to grow, to grow, to develop yourself and to have the confidence to fly away from the nest and, and know that you always will have a home back with us, but to go and do different stuff. So um, that to me is also a sign of a, of a healthy culture. I think that's a beautiful um, way of thinking about growing our team and then helping them fly. I think that's absolutely beautiful. Now, I want to ask you one final question because you have been so full of great advice today and particularly around women trying to design a career that they love and design a work life that they love. If you could offer three pieces of advice for anyone wanting to design their ideal life, ideally a life that they love, what would they be and why? I get really nervous about advice. (laughs) <laughs> I'm always a little bit like, who am I to give advice? I don't know. We all are just doing our best as we go, you know, day to day. I don't know. But I mean, one thing I would encourage people to do is to ask themselves, who do I want to be in my life? Be really, really clear on that. And, you know, and that will help you sort of focus on who you want to be spending time with and the people that value you and make you feel good, that fill you up, that you also kind of do the same for the for them. And that will help you to give energy to the right people. I do hear a lot of women saying, I feel like all my energy is expended in on XYZ friend. Then maybe it's time to break up with that friend. Mm-hmm. Or like in this job where there's like emotional capital the whole time not the right job. It's like, so think about who do, who are the important people in your life and who do you value and who do you want in your life and be intentional about that and then work out, well, how much time do you spend with those people versus other people that or energy suckers, you know, mm. who are the people that are giving you energy? Because if they're sucking the life out of you, then I would encourage you to think about whether or not you are living your best life you know, yeah. empaths can struggle a bit with that because you get, I'm a bit like that, you get a bit sucked into a bit of the drama with people. So it's really setting boundaries and untethering yourself a little bit. Um, and that includes social media. Yes. <laughs> who, who are you following and why and who makes you feel good and who doesn't? And, you know, so, so just look at those things. I would say that number one. Number two, I would say find something that you're passionate about. Mm-hmm. It might be helping people, other people. And if you can't do that through your work, then how can you do that through your life? It might be putting notes under the neighbours' doors during pandemic saying here to order you, you know, drop off groceries if you need or something. That that might fill your cup because you're someone that is passionate about helping people. So there's heaps of ways that you can um, make that possible for yourself if that's what your passion is. It might be interior design. 
Great. If that's your passion, follow every interior design on Instagram and Pinterest. Think about what you, you know, can control with that. Maybe it could be a career in that. Maybe, you know what I mean? It might be sport. It might be, it might be online shopping. Like I'm not, you know, <laughs> some people probably listening to this bell going, I don't really know what my passion is. It's like, well, what, what do you like doing? And what and lights how, you up? What, what do you lights enjoy? you up? Yeah. And then when you've sort of identified those, you know, those couple of things light you up, how can you carve more time into your week to do that? Because life yeah. is short, you know, like, so if it's reading, then be intentional with non-negotiable time where you, you read because that's something that makes you feel really, really good or watching documentaries, put something in your group chatter or whatever at work saying who's, what's the best doco you've watched lately? I don't know. But just find a passion, something that lights you up and try to um, give a little bit more energy to that thing when you do have five minutes of spare time. My third piece, and this is maybe a little bit personal, but I, I do think that this is... I think this would translate to most people, is to give and be grateful. Having a generosity of spirit is an incredible gift for yourself. Like, so it might be the generosity to give your time to something or just having a beautiful generosity of spirit around, it's not generosity around money, it's not money related at all, it's generosity around how you show up for people. So be present when someone's talking to you. That's a gift. Active listening, you know, all of those things to me are giving and then be grateful. So I know everyone hears this a billion, billion times, you know, but practising a little bit of gratitude is wonderful. I think right now it's super important because, you know, we're definitely all in the storm and, as we said, we're not all in the same boat but we're all navigating this storm together. But to me it's, yeah, they're, they're probably the three things. It's like who are the people I love, what do I love and how can I give that gift of who I am to other people and also be grateful for what I have in, our, in my life. So I think the common thread there is just around energy in and energy out so like Mm. really kind of focus on on where your energy is going each week and um you know know thyself in terms of okay I'm depleted this week well I bet you if you look at the three buckets there there's probably a good chance you've done nothing for yourself you have been around energy zappers you probably haven't had a chance to give anything else of yourself which is fair enough and you probably haven't had any time to be grateful because you know so they maybe would be my three I think they're a great three and I think the way you summarised it there is energy in and energy out is a really good way for us to look at it because that has a massive impact on how we show up, how we feel about ourselves and, you know, when we can practice gratitude, people who are more joyful have been known and do demonstrate a much stronger gratitude practice. So. There's always something that we can be grateful for. Sometimes it's a little bit hard to find and we have to dig deep, but there will always be something that we can be grateful for. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, you have shared with us some absolute pearls of wisdom today and so much of yourself. So I really, really appreciate it, Liv. And thanks so much for joining me. My pleasure. It was so good to talk with you. Thanks so much, Liv. No probs. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining me for Work Life by Design. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd love you to rate, review or subscribe or all three in iTunes and share it with your friends so we can continue to build this community. I would love to hear from you. If you have any thoughts, questions or suggestions, you can connect with me on Instagram at Melma or send me an email at melissa at melissamarsden.com.au. I hope this episode has given you a few sparks of inspiration so you can design a work life you love.